me get started then, Sophie. Sounds good. Um, just welcome everybody again. Uh, thanks to everyone um, from the public in attendance. Thanks to everyone from each of the institutions, the presidents and their staffs that are in attendance. And thanks also for the committee members who are here today as well. Um, we've been long range planning in all of the committees and the board is, itself has been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of um, work, a lot of meetings, a lot of important engagement discussion and um, just wanna recognize that. And thanks, thank, thank you to everybody for being here today and continuing um, that, that work. It's really important, but um, it does not go unnoticed how much time and attention we're asking um, from those both on the board and from the public and the institutions as well. So one thing I want to announce right at, at the beginning is that Sean Tester is going to be joining the long range planning um, committee. I just saw a note from uh, Chairwoman Dickinson on that. So we're really excited to have uh, Sean join us. He has a strong hospital system background. He has strong roots in the Northeast Kingdom um, as well. So looking forward to having his perspective um, on the committee. And um, yeah, that will be an excellent addition. So today's agenda, we have, an, uh, uh, it's more informational, although we do have a couple of items that we want to take action on, one um, pretty technical and one more substantive. The technical item is approving the minutes from July 23rd. The more technical, the more substantive um, uh, ask is that we will be having a discussion of the um, chancellor's recommendations for strategic action for the current academic year 2000 uh, to 2001. And um, it'll be a discussion, it'll, we want everyone's feedback. And then ultimately, I think what we want is everyone's um, recognition that the Long Range Planning Committee supports the particular strategic actions that were selected for this year, given that they're achievable, they're important, and um, that you know, we can get them done within the next six to eight months. So um, we'll be asking for that vote. Um, and then we'll also be getting more um, information regarding uh, the select committee on the future of uh, public uh, higher education in Vermont. Uh, we wanna make sure the committee is well-versed in what they are um, exploring and discussing, uh, ensuring that you're aware of what their timelines are and how that matches with uh, different timelines for both the board, um, the different committees of the board, the legislature, the legislative process itself, the budget process. Um, uh, so we will also be having a discussion about timelines to make sure um, we're aware of each one of those individual threads, but more importantly, how they are um, tied into each other and impact each other in terms of timing. Uh, and then of course, other business, and we will um, take comments from the public, of course, as well. Uh, so with that, I would ask folks to take a look at the minutes from July 23rd and ask if there are any edits or corrections to those minutes. I'll move we approve those. This is Adam. So moved by Adam. Do we have a second? Dylan seconds. Dylan from the uh, second from Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. No. Aye. And the minutes are approved. So thank you, everybody. So why don't we get right into the discussion? And I'm going to turn this portion over to Sophie, who's going to walk through um, the chancellor's recommendations. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Sophie. Thank you so much. Um, so this is, we, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we presented and the board approved the VSC's strategic priorities. Uh, we've been working in consultation, uh, we meaning the chancellor's office, primarily me and, and my senior leadership team, along with the presidents, um, to talk about what can we start moving forward with on these strategic priorities, because we have to be realistic and they're all really important. Uh, we identified a lot of areas where we felt we could we could really move the needle on some things, but um, we can't do everything at once. So what you have in front of you is the recommendations for strategic action for us to take in this year. Um, the goal would be, um, you know, if that meets with your approval, pass that on to the full board at the upcoming meeting on the 16th of November, along at that time with the president's individual strategies for how they're going to accomplish um, the particular item. So it may differ by institution. Uh, they will be including uh, key performance indicators, benchmarks, and timelines. So some of these things we could start this year. We won't necessarily accomplish, you know, you'll see as we go through this, some of them are, are big long-term things we can't do and just simply uh, a flick of a switch and make them happen this year. So that will happen at the um, upcoming board meeting. 
but this was really a document, a sort of transition document between the very big picture on the strategic priorities, what we're recommending we focus on, and then the board, the chancellors, uh, the sorry, the presidents focusing on the individual actions they're planning on taking. Um, so as part of this, um, I did want to emphasize all the things that we are doing. Um, we're doing in the chancellor's office um, from at a system level rather than, I mean, the presidents will be doing the pieces from their individual um, institutions. But we do have a number of things that are already happening uh, this year. So you already are aware of the system-wide budget that we're working on and we'll be hearing more about that in the finance and facilities committee meeting this afternoon. That's a very significant um, action that will really impact a lot of other areas that we're working on. We're also going to be evaluating and working on um, the centralized payroll and benefit system. I think um, everybody knows there have been challenges with the implementation of that. We've been working extraordinarily hard to try to correct them. Um, and there are additional efficiencies that we believe can be gained from that system. And we really need to realize the full benefit of it to benefit um, the colleges and provide them with what we, what we promised them we would provide them with uh, when we implemented that. We're also going to be looking at ways to improve and streamline our accounts payable system. Uh, right now, it's it's a clunky system. Um, I don't do that many um, uh, invoices, but um, you know it can be very frustrating. You get right to the very end of the form and you put in something incorrect. You have to do the whole thing all over again. Uh, we're just there are challenges for folks that have to process a lot of invoices. So that's a business operation. We're going to be looking to see what we can do to help with that. Uh, we're also going to be looking into adopting a system-wide purchasing and procurement process. Uh, we're also going to be conducting um, an analysis of all the software purchases that the system has. Uh, one of the big issues that often comes up is the size of the chancellor's budget. Uh, I think one thing people don't realize often is that a, a significant portion of that is taken up with um, software costs, um, which obviously are, aren't, don't belong to the chancellor's office, they belong to the colleges. We may want to explore is there a better way to account for that and have that those costs transferred to the um, college's budgets? But that's a, a you know conversation for us to have. But in order to really look at our IT costs, we're going to be going through um, the different packages we have. You know, colleague, Canvas, Aviso. There's a whole host of smaller ones that we all use to see are we using them in, in the most efficient way? Are we getting full use out of them? Are we no longer using them? Are they things that we could um, stop using. So, you know, IT has been a growing cost, um, not just for us, obviously, but something that we should take a look at to see if there's a way um, to be more efficient and assess the value of, of those items. Um, we'll also be launching an online uh, website. Um, this is connected to the fourth charge that the board gave to um, the chancellor and the presidents coming out of the VSES forward task force. Uh, Yasmin didn't really have an opportunity to touch base on this in the previous meeting for EPSL. So um, maybe when we get through this, it might be worth having Yasmin just say a few words on that, um, but looking to make it easier for students to access courses across the system. Again, it ties in with the conversation that we've just had from EPSL. Uh, we're also going to be working with primarily Castleton and Northern Vermont University on financial aid optimization. Uh, there certainly has been a lot of competition in the past um, and we've, we've, uh, we can do a better job on that. That's something we'll be looking at. And also, as was just touched on in the previous meeting, we're looking at expanding the Hartness Library model uh, for web-based services to Castleton and to Northern Vermont University to serve as the virtual library core for the entire system. So those are things at the system level that we will be working on. And then going back to the strategic priorities uh, that were discussed um, two weeks ago, uh, the first one was affordability and reducing the total cost of attendance for students and families. So the specific items under that that we're going to be looking to commit to for this academic year, reducing the cost of textbooks and ancillary materials for students. So for example, that could be open educational resources, but ways to help bring down costs. I know it's been a long time since I was in college, but I've heard stories of, you know, $600 science textbooks and things. It's a significant cost that I think sometimes we don't always, uh, when we're far removed from it, appreciate um, what a challenge that can be for students. Improving the on-time graduation rate, obviously that's not something we can do very swiftly, but there are strategies that can be implemented to start moving the needle on that. And increasing average class size at residential campuses 
again, that was something that was sort of touched on in the previous meeting. Uh, we do have some, you know, just given the nature of the programs and enrollment in programs, we are running a lot of courses with very small numbers of students in them. And um, some of the select committee materials um, that are available on the Joint Fiscal Office website um, are, you know, will point that out, like how very small some of our classes are. Um, the second uh, strategic priority was accessibility. And so we've picked two of the accessibility um, items that were identified in the strategic priorities. The first one is increased access to VSCS programs, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, educational attainment of parents, prior educational experience, family status, or place of residence. And the commitment on this one is that we will commit to expanding access to the uh, system programs for traditional and non-traditional students offering flexible delivery, flexible delivery modalities, such as in-person, virtual, hybrid, and flexible scheduling, such as accelerated programs, evenings and weekends, to try to really broaden um, the students' ability to participate in the programs that we have. The other accessibility uh, priority that we wanted to focus on was making sure that students receive the academic advising and other supports necessary to succeed in their VSES programs as measured by their retention, persistence, and graduation. Again, that's not something you can um, address immediately, but we can certainly start doing things. We won't necessarily accomplish that in you know, six to eight months, but there are ways that we can commit to improving the support services that are available to our students through expanded training on and use of Canvas, the learning management system that we have, and Aviso, the advising software across the system as well as improved career counseling and mentorship of at-risk students. So I think there are strategies there that can be done to help on that issue. Uh, the fourth one was um, under the quality strategic priority and the focus for this year would be on the ability of VSCS graduates to meet externally recognized measures of achievement, such as licensure exam success rates and their preparation to compete in the global workforce. So one of the things that, that we face as a challenge is we don't really know that much about what our graduates do and where they go and who employs them. Some institutions uh, do a better job of that than others. VTC, I know, has, has done a very good job um, in terms of reaching out to their graduates sort of within six months of graduation and finding out what they're doing. But really, in order to, to make progress on this particular measure, we really need to have more information. So we're going to commit to conducting an annual survey of recent graduates and their employee, employers starting this year but it wouldn't just be for one year. The goal would be to, to continue with that moving forward. And then the final one is the relevance um, priority and development of career paths that are relevant to student goals and expectations of value in a career. And the commitment on this one is that the, the Vermont State Colleges will expand the development of degree paths with embedded industry recognized credentials. I understand that CCV is already doing that. Uh, VTC is looking to do that, but it's really important that we start building ways for students um, so that they can acquire credentials and other things. So if they don't complete a four-year degree, for example, they are leaving with something. Um, so this would be part of that. So those were the um, specific recommendations that we were um, looking to forward to the full board. Um, again, there'll be more information at the full board meeting in terms of the actual strategies that individual colleges uh, will be uh, using to achieve those particular goals. So happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. I think, you know, we'll turn it over to questions in just one minute. And, um, you know, I think the, the goals and both the level of granularity, I think you've struck a good balance in terms of, you know, making them actionable and measurable. I mean, that's always a critical and important when you're talking about strategic initiatives and plans and um, you know, for, for almost every category, there are some really, uh, you know, articulated, uh, you know, um, uh, goals that you want to achieve. So I just want to recognize that off the top. Any um, board members have questions for Sophie? Yeah, and I would just add to follow up on that, Mike. I think it is critical to have the measurement piece because it's all well and good saying we're going to do X, but if it's like, when are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? How are you going to measure whether you succeeded on it or not? And I think that's that's really important. Um, and again, I, I do want to recognize the limited bandwidth that everybody has. So we're trying to 
trying to do as much as we can do, but do it in a responsible way rather than biting off more than we can chew and then not being successful on anything. Yeah, that's, that's a, a very um, reasonable approach, Sophie. And I think, you know, getting some momentum of making even incremental change is really gonna be good for the system. Um, so having those uh, goals that are articulated and achievable, I think achievable being the key word uh, this year, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a good balance. And I think there's an expectation from the legislature that we that we be doing something, you know, that it's important that we demonstrate what we're doing and can show that we're making progress and we are working on the transformation. So I, I think it's um, just vital that we be seen to be making forward progress. Mike? Yes, Karen. Uh, Sophie, I just want to applaud you and and all your support, uh, folks. I think it's an exceptional it's an exceptional effort, and it's a very difficult task. So all of it taken together, um, and the times are are especially stressful. So I know that um, everybody's juggling lots of balls, and to see us moving forward under the current conditions, I, I applaud everybody. It's good work. Well, and I, I do want to thank, I mean, it, this really is not, um, you know, it's, it really is a collaboration with the colleges. We've been working with the presidents. We've had a lot of conversations and um, discussion about what we can achieve. Um, so trying to be considerate of what they have on their plates as well. Michael. And, and for those, I did just um, indicate, I think the um, long range planning committee I see Beth's question um, and um, she's going to be post, uh, Jen is going to be posting those materials uh, right now. So they should be available. Great, thanks Sophie and thanks Jen. Lynn? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say uh, to basically agree with Karen that these are really, this is a really good start. It's a really good document. Uh, one of the questions I had on the quality piece and I don't know, exactly how that's, what the details on that are, but VSAC has been doing a survey of high school graduates a year out after they graduate. Um, and I don't know what their methodology is or what, but they have been doing it apparently maybe every two years for years and years and years. And uh, that might be something that we can work with them to develop mm -hmm. that survey or either that or through the, maybe even through the Castleton, uh, there it's, there isn't a Castleton polling anymore, but Richard Clark is, um, I think that's his name, is the- Yeah, it is. I think that was the, I think that was the anticipation. Of, yeah. Yeah. But instead of reinventing the wheel, we could maybe work together. Yeah, because I think the challenge is in order for us to find out if we're doing a good job with employers, we kind of need to know where people have gone. So, you know, I, having the data, I think will be really important for us moving forward um, yeah. to really make progress on those particular goals that we have as strategic priorities. Yeah, yeah, for like nursing students, it would be easy because they take a national <laughs> boards, but, but yeah, for everyone else, it would certainly be helpful. Yeah, and I mean, yes, I mean this, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just, just going to say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sophie. <laughs> I was just going to say, if Yasmin wanted to just add something about um, the, because as we didn't get to get to it in Epsil, I don't know, Yasmin, if you just wanted to add something quickly on the, the, the website piece. Oh, certainly. I mean, th that work is underway. Um, we have a, a vendor selected and we're, we're sending out a survey, I think, to students in the, in the next day or so to get their feedback on, you know, what information do they need to um, or do they most care about when they're searching for courses so that we're designing a site um, that meets their needs in finding more information, finding out more information about what's available to them. So that's that's where we're at there. But I think, you know, a lot of the um, things that uh, Tom and Nolan alluded to in EPSL as well are, you know, really consistent with, with the activities here. So more professional development obviously is also important as an example. Mike, uh, Adam here. here. Um, I don't know if this is where within the agenda today we would be talking about some of the, the National Center for Higher Education, their, their study and some of the findings that they had, assuming um, some of that has fed into 
um, the priorities that we're discussing right now under the chancellor's recommendation, but just trying to understand a bigger picture of the long range planning committee and our role within um, some of these other findings that we've read about in our packet. Yes, yes. I think maybe ahead, I'll just start Sophie and then I'll let Sophie expand <laughs> on it because, you know, um, I think like the role of the long range planning committee and, and what we're trying to serve um, in that role today is, you know, to make sure this group is at least aware of all of the different um, work processes and threads that are out there. There are quite a few and um, it's easy to forget about one or two when there's so much else going on. So the conversation about our future as the system, you know, has certainly been broadened out, not just beyond this committee and the board, but, you know, to um, the legislature and to other stakeholders. So I think we will continue to play, you know, an important, um, you know, advisory and policy developing role as we continue to move forward on some of these transitional items. But I think there are some bigger um, long-term items that need to be addressed and decided by these different work streams that are out there. And that's why we want to at least make sure the committee is aware of them and aware of what those timelines are. Sophie, anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, the, the board itself is kind of the long range planning committee too. I mean, it's um, because everyone really needs to be involved. Um, you know, at, at when this committee started, which was just a few years ago, it wasn't originally a standing committee of, of the board. Um, it was because we could see the adverse headwinds that were, were, were coming and it was confronting us and, and higher education and particularly in the Northeast. But I think at this point, given our particular situation, really uh, the whole board needs to be um, engaged with this. But yeah, we're, we're dealing this through the long range planning committee. We have a lot of members, uh, trustees and members of this committee. And I, I know we've got other trustees that are paying attention to what happens um, in this long range planning committee too. So really it's just a question of, of time. I mean, we couldn't do, you know, today we have a full day of committee meetings, but if we do, if we replicate this in its entirety at the board meeting, it just makes our board meetings so long. So uh, we're trying to cover everything, um, make sure everyone has all the information that they need. We certainly heard at the last board meeting that there's interest from the trustees in understanding all the different processes that are going on and concern about the role of the select committee, the role of the board, what's happening at the legislature. So we're trying to bring all those threads together at this meeting today. Yeah, and thank you for doing that. It's, uh, it's appreciated. <laughs> Other um, questions from the committee? As I see Pat has her hand up. Yeah, Pat, Pat Moulton. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not technically part of the committee. <laughs> no, I, I was gonna ask the, I was gonna ask the presidents and, and even those, any other, anyone else joining us if they have comments at the, after. So go ahead, Pat, please. Well, first of all, I just really applaud these um, strategic priorities and particularly maximizing the benefit of those systems we've already put in place. And I think that's critically important. And then just speaking to the survey, because uh, we do one annually six months out, and we are able to get an 85, many times 90% return because we hound our graduates. I mean, our <laughs> career services person just doesn't let them off the hook. She knows down to a name who doesn't answer the survey. So that's one of the reasons why we feel so confident in that data. And while I am a big advocate of surveying, if we really wanna hang our hat on placement data, we, we're going to have to take a far more proactive approach to that, I feel, than you know, a, a simple survey where you might get 15 or whatever percent return. And then my third point really relates to you know, the help desk and, and Sophie's point about really trying to incorporate IT into student success and things like retention and et cetera. And, and I know Kelly Campbell is uh, somewhere on this list of folks, and you know, I invite her to just give me you know, two seconds if she's able. But... I mean, we have to have a help desk not be a fix it it's done. It really has to be services that, that integrate and incorporate with our academic programs to see where IT can really be brought home to support retention and support our students in a big way. I mean, that's Kelly's expertise. We're thrilled to have her. Um, but I, I just want to drive that 
point home also that you know we need to start getting you know rt is our business partner and support but we need to take it that next level and i don't know if you want to quickly add anything else to that kelly uh, thanks, Pat, and thanks, everyone. Um, no, I think you said it well, Pat, and I think as, um, you know, Sophie, you're well aware, we, we've chatted. I think as we look at some of these strategic bullets and initiatives, and then I was just making notes about your uh, well-outlined bullets of affordability and accessibility and quality and relevance. I mean, every single thing Sophie said, I think IT plays a critical role, um, and I think we've seen that through COVID, but wanting to ensure as we start to think about how we position and support and resource IT, that we understand the critical need. And, and I think that we're well aware that we are not just about break fix and we're not just about providing uh, computers and network, right? That we need to be strategic partners in moving a lot of these critical uh, efforts forward um, and truly be shifting from operationals to strategy. Um, and I think that's a priority for IT and I think we're aware of it, um, but wanting to kind of name that in how we approach some of these objectives. So thanks, Pat. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, no thanks. I actually skipped over that one and unintentionally when I was reading through my list here. So thank you for raising that back up, yeah. Yeah, again, I mean, I think part of what we're looking forward to, and again, we want to be realistic about how much we can handle, but we don't want to have, you know, four separate ways of doing things if we can collaborate across the system and we have different strengths at different places. So if, and I use this example all the time, but I mean, Kelly, who you just heard from is, is really, um, you know, an expert on academic technology. So she's at VTC, but that would be a great asset that, you know, hopefully we can uh, use her knowledge and benefit from that across the system rather than uh, it doesn't have to be someone centralized in the central office. We can benefit from having um, expertise elsewhere in the system. Um, and that's something we need to be looking for too. So if you just to clarify, it was number three under accessibility that you didn't highlight just for everyone's awareness. No, just a list of system-wide initiatives. I just skipped right over. I just oh, okay. accidentally skipped over it. It was after I was talking about reviewing the current software and then I went into the website and I missed the help desk that was oh, okay. listed Great. there. We're looking at, at trying to, again, we haven't really gone very far down the path, but we've just started having conversations about um, developing a system-wide help desk. Because again, different people have different expertise across the system and help um, have a more robust um, way of supporting people longer hours, but then less stress on the individual campuses. So figuring out a way to do that in a shared way rather than um, everyone individually having to man their own help desk. So. And, I, and, and Sophie, I think it's maybe, this is more of a um, implementation item. So, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just put it out there, but on that survey piece that Pat mentioned, you know, it, we do say the Vermont State College System will conduct an annual survey. Maybe it's implicit that each institution will conduct their own survey in a unified way. But, um, but I could imagine, to Pat's point, you know, you need, you need, you know, most people are most familiar with their institution rather than the system, probably most recent graduates. But each system might, you know, CCV might want something a little bit different than the residential colleges if, you know, if they, if they do that kind of surveying as well. So maybe just something to think about in the implementation piece. That makes sense. And I appreciate Pat's point too, is, you know, nagging is always important on those kinds of things to get good quality results. Yeah, exactly right. It's very, I mean, the information and the data will be great, but you wanna make sure um, that it's as complete as it can be and, and as um, solid as it can be. Any other um, questions or comments from the other presidents or members of the other institutions or any comments i know we have a public comment later but i'd be interested if, if anyone that's um on the meeting has any public comment or questions uh, on these initiatives as well can and i feel say free something? to speak up because i oh yeah beth go ahead yes thanks um i really appreciate pat bringing up the fact that we all do send out graduate surveys. In fact, while I've been listening to you, I have been putting the labels on the postcard that says you'll be, we're asking you for your input. Um, it's a, at one point, the Castleton polling 
Institute was going to take it on. And actually the day we met to discuss it was the day that Castleton shut down the polling Institute. And so we were heartbroken because we really thought this might be a way to get a better response rate. The response rate has been going down, down, down. And so I really am excited to hear what you all come up with for a way to get our graduates to respond to these surveys. It's important information. We have such long 20 years of these surveys. So the longitudinal information is great, but when you have a 13% response rate, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, that's a great point, Beth. And that, and that long, you know, that rich data set of multiple years is really valuable to see trends and where things are moving and, you know, what fields people are going into. And so what well, point well taken. I'm scrolling through, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to speak up as well. So Sophie, just one other point I just wanted to make is that, uh, you know, I think, you know, some of these items like um, under affordability, you know, reducing the cost of textbooks and, and associated materials um, with uh, those that are public sourced or, uh, you know, it's just like a, it's like, it's really, you know, this is a small item, but it can be a really big, a big item for a student. And I think it's things like that, that are really um, important no brainers that we can get working on and, and get implemented um, and make some impact. So um, I just, I wanted to call that one out specifically, because I know, I know that, you know, when you, when you think about all the costs it takes to get to higher ed and then on top of that, to get almost a surprise bill for how much your books are, it's, it can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I do know, I mean, CCV has done a lot of work on that. And I mean, uh, Joyce would certainly say that um, there are students uh, that when they're choosing which section to take, will look to see what the cost of textbooks are. I mean, right. they're not, you know, they're pretty smart in figuring out um, what the costs are. Um, and I know we've had faculty, um, you know, I know Greg Petrix up at NVU Johnson, has, is really you know doing an enormous amount um, in this area. So it, it's not to suggest we don't have people doing really good right. value work on this already, but it's just something we can expand on and help improve for, for students. Joyce, yeah, I didn't point. wanted to add anything on. <laughs> I would just say, echo what Sophie says. Um, we, a few years ago, went to um, making it available. So faculty know when they order, it, order their textbooks, they know what the cost is, because I think in all fairness, I think a lot of times faculty ordered a textbook but didn't really know what the costs are. Now right. faculty can find out, I mean, it's right there. You know, the price changes a little bit, but you get the ballpark. I mean, it might be, you know, 199 now and it might be 189 when, because it's a, it's, a, um, it's a rolling piece until they lock it in. But I think, um, the other piece is helping um, students also in the end with their costs. And so I think you all know we started a life gap endowment program. Um, so that right. it is oftentimes uh, it's those, those invisible barrier, uh, you know, expenditures that get in the way. People figure out how to pay for tuition and all of a sudden they do have this huge um, textbook cost and they run from continuing education. So I think trying to figure out on both ends, contain costs, being creative, and also are there ways that we can support students um, uh, as, because there always will be some costs. So are there some ways to deal with it on both ends? That's great, thanks Joyce. Any other, any other questions or comments? We'll have an, a broader opportunity to talk about this at, at the full board meeting, but what I do hope is that we can um, approve these as um, you know, recommendations from the Long Range Planning Committee um, and have them uh, be presented uh, at the board meeting. That would be helpful because then the presidents can continue their work on the strategies. If we don't know what the board's going to approve, it's, it's harder for them to do that. So there aren't any questions I'd ask for a motion from the from the committee uh, if we're so interested to do that at this time. I'd like to make one comment. Yeah, I, Bill. Yeah, uh, I think in, in terms of follow up, uh, 
this follow-up surveys to see uh, where students are after they've graduated. Uh, I think we need to be thoughtful about not having somehow that conveyed as there's a judgment involved as to what is uh, success and what is not success. Uh, that, 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 that may contribute to the nature of the response that we get. If we have a certain idea, like, oh, well, if you've done this, then we've been successful and you've been successful. But if, if, you, mm -hmm. if you haven't achieved this in this time frame, uh, people might be less likely to say what they're really doing. Yeah, it's interesting, Bill. Maybe, maybe it's almost, um, you know, this qualitative, like, are you, you know, how, how satisfied are you with the, you know, with your, with the position or the job that you have now, or, you know, is this the is this the field that you wanted that you were intending to go in and that you wanted to go in? You know, and, the, and if people are able to say, "Yeah, I'm, you know, I was able to do what I wanted to do, and I'm enjoying it," those are good. Those are as important metrics. when we had our breakout groups on this, um, our group kind of brainstormed some of those kinds of questions. It was much broader than you know, some material success or your salary or whatever, it, it really went to, you know, are you fulfilled? Are you, is this what you thought you were going to get? You know, it was, it was a pretty broad, it was a brainstorm. So I'm sure the, I'm sure the call it, the, the system will figure out the right question. Yeah. It was never intended to be this narrow targeted definition. Yeah. I'm sure there's smart people thinking about this. So thank you. And, and just to comment, um, uh, just a sidebar, there's, and I won't name the person, but everybody here would know the person, uh, pretty successful, pretty successful CEO of a major Vermont corporate entity. Um, and you'd look at all the skill set that that person would need, drama major. <laughs> and the world is filled with people who did all kinds of things, studied study different things and end up something that if you step back and thought about it a bit you think my god yeah that those skills do relate to this or it led into picking up some other background with, with something and that philosophy major for example that and it, it didn't work at this time but that's a great major for people who go into a number of things um anyway um so I, I hear what you're saying, Bill, but you know, straight out of college, people aren't gonna land where they're gonna land ultimately in life. They're doing something that may lead. It's a step into something, but it's yeah, valuable. That's, yeah, that's part of what I was thinking about as well. You got a false measurement. Yeah. Only to parents sometimes. <laughs> Choice, you're mu muted. Yes, just for the record, my undergraduate degree is in animal science. And if you'd asked me two years, three years, five years out of college, what I was doing, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been classified probably as a success story. I think I'm saying some of the same things. Thank yeah. you, Joyce. <laughs> probably some personal projection here. Yeah. <laughs> Western European history. <laughs> Yeah, Lynn. Does some of that, does some of that get, um, yeah, because it's skewed toward the people who are happy and successful in their minds um, as a survey, but, um, and obviously many, several years out, we become more um, wise about what we consider to be success and what we wanna do. Obviously many of us didn't do the things that we did in college, but um, when you hire a third person, third party group, or even if you created a non, um, I mean, it costs money, but the point is, is that you could create a, you know, like VSEC is a totally different group than we are, for instance, and they could, under their ages, we could do it. Something like that, where you get a real response, not just only the good people, the Facebook happy people. Uh, 
I'll make a motion. I don't know if we're still looking for a motion. <laughs> we are. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so Bill has moved. Do we have a second? I think Karen's waving. A second. Great. Karen, thank you very much. Bill's moved. Karen, second. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 I have it, and um, the recommendations are um, adopted by the Long Range Planning Committee for further recommendation to the board. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, um, Sophie. So Sophie, I'll, I'll turn it back to you now to talk about the, um, the broader um, public committee that uh, both Megan and Joyce have um, been uh, highly involved in, and Joyce actually the chairperson of. But um, Sophie, why don't we uh, turn it over to you to get that um, uh, detailed information about uh, their activities so far. Yeah, so I've included materials um, in the packet, but I'll, I'll just run through um, quickly. Um, so the select committee was created by the legislature in the first quarter transitional budget. And as, as uh, Trustee Lippert noted last time, um, there was an expectation that the, the creation of the select um, committee was also part of the decision to provide us with the bridge funding. So. Um, you know, there is some um, expectation that we will be working with and alongside the select committee as we move forward. Um, it was intended to assist the state of Vermont in addressing the urgent needs of the Vermont State Colleges and develop an integrated vision and plan for a high quality, affordable and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. Um, is the specific um, language that it was created to do. There are 15 members. Um, I won't read through all of them, but they're um, from, you know, we've got there are community business members. There's um, a senator, a, a, re a representative, the president of VSAT, the president of UVM, trustee from UVM. We obviously have Megan as our trustee on it. Um, there are several uh, designees from uh, the state uh, administration. So there's, um, Sarah Buxton from Workforce Development, Heather Boucher from the Agency of Education. Uh, we have Dan Daly, um, who's one of our faculty members at NVU Linden. We have Devin Tingle, who's a student at Vermont Tech. As mentioned, uh, Joyce Judy, is the administrator from the Vermont State College System, but she's also the chair of the committee. Um, myself, uh, Megan Kluver. And then we have um, Jeff Weld, who is an alum and former um, employee as well from Castleton University. So we've, we, we have a number of representatives on the committee. Uh, the committee has 15, there's a steering group that has five people on it. So Trustee Kluver, um, President Judy are on the steering group along with uh, Briar Alpert, who is the UVM trustee, uh, Heather Boucher and Sarah Buxton. And the steering group selected an external consultant uh, to work with the select committee uh, we pay for that out of our bridge funding. It, it's where we didn't get to pick. It was done through by the steering group and is managed through the joint fiscal office, but it does come out of the bridge funding, the 5 million that we got in that um, first quarter transitional budget. Um, so the I've included in the materials, I'm not gonna read it all out, but the charge to the committee, um, the external consultant that was, was selected was NCHEMS, which I now know uh, is National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, so we're not using just acronyms. And they've been um, working the last couple of months on this. They, they were given, when they initially submitted their proposal, the thought was it was an 18-month process. Um, once the committee was formed, there was an understanding that 18 months, which is what's provided for in the legislation, is really too long. And so um, the steering group has shortened the, the timelines. So right now, um, the first interim report by NCHEMS is due December 4th. Uh, the second report is due February 12th and the final report April 16th. So that really condenses the time frame in which NCHEMS has to do its work. Um, there is, and I, I find it very interesting, um, so I've included in the materials, but is the um, RFP that um, NCHEMS provided where they, they had an additional piece to the RFP, but it, it discusses how they propose getting all the work done within this very short time frame. Um, and I think that's a helpful thing. I would encourage the, the, the trustees to review it. Um, I know there are questions about what is it the select committee is doing and how are they doing it? And that's really laid out in great detail in that document. Um, 
So right now, the, the first interim report is um, we're scheduled to be focused on financial sustainability, but I understand from the, um, the RFP that it, it's going to be broader than that. Um, and I think that under the RFP that they put out, they're indicating they will be in that report, they'll be talking about back office operations of campuses um, that can be centralized either at the system office or the campus within the system that has the greatest capacity to perform the functions. Uh, educational programs being deliver delivered collaboratively, which again, we've already heard about this morning from EPSL. Um, and again, the back office operations, I mean, these are all things that we're looking at right now. Um, they also um, are talking about local sites being maintained as student service centers and looking at different scenarios under which the Vermont State Colleges can maintain fiscal sustainability and serve students, employers in the state. So I believe that that first report will be beyond just the financial sustainability. And again, um, I know Trustee Kluver and President Judy will probably have more information than I do because I know they had a steering group committee uh, just this week, which I haven't had a chance to watch yet. Uh, all these um, meetings are um, live streamed and they're available after the fact as well um, on YouTube. Um, so there's the select committee has been meeting approximately once a month and the steering group, and I'm looking at you, Megan, I, are you meeting once a week or once every couple of weeks? I know it's more frequently than we're meeting. We're meeting every other week, Sophie. Okay. Um, so I did include in the materials, um, there's on the Joint Fiscal Office website, there's just general background information. Um, some of it I thought would be helpful for this committee to have by way of resources. There are active links in those materials. And then I included some of the PowerPoints that uh, the legislator, that the NCHEMS group has used to present to the select committee, um, as well as um, they have a list of proposed goals and high level observations. And then uh, their presentation that we had at our last committee meeting, which was on October 19th. Um, they presented some summary observations at uh, the October 19th meeting, and I did want to run through those with you. Um, they've recognized that business as usual is not an option, nor is incremental change to the status quo. I think everyone has a concern. This is just another legislative committee. It'll do its work. It'll get put on a shelf somewhere. Nothing will happen. Um, I would like to believe that this time is different. I believe that people recognize that the status quo is not acceptable and that uh, this is a, a genuine commitment um, by the legislature and the state to really engage in what the future of the Vermont State College is and, and the future of public higher education in Vermont is. Um, so that's something um, you know, that I think we, we should take hope from. It's not just a legislative committee that, you know, they're going to do something and no one's going to pay any further attention to it. There are other observations were that the VSC is overbuilt for its current uh, student population, both in personnel and facilities. Uh, they say that in the face of unfavorable demographic trends, right sizing of the Vermont State Colleges will require some combination of increasing enrollments among populations not currently being served, reducing employment and the physical footprint of the campuses. Certainly the population's not currently being served. There's a, a focus on um, adult learners, um, the credentials serving the adult population and completing degrees, but also industry recognized credentials, other things that we can be providing education on. Um, another observation is that neither the state's higher education policies nor institutional practices are designed to meet the needs of underserved populations, adults and low income students. Again, that's something we're hoping to address with the strategic priorities we've been discussing. Uh, we obviously have um, our student population is quite distinct from that of UVM. Uh, we do serve a lot of students um, that are uh, would traditionally be underserved by higher education. We have a lot of Pell eligible students. We have a lot of students that come from um, you know, challenging circumstances, first generation, low income disabilities. Um, so we do you know, we do seek to serve those students, um, but uh, evidently there's more work we can do on that. Uh, their fifth observation, compelling educational and political reasons exist not to close institutions, but maintaining existing locations can only be accomplished by implementing substantial changes to institutional missions and functions. Uh, their sixth is the VSC institution policies are designed to serve institutional needs, not students, and create barriers to student enrollment and success. So that's something I would be interested in hearing more from them in terms of what, what do they see specifically as barriers uh, that we can address 
And again, to the extent those are institutional policies, that's something we can be working with the board on. Uh, and then their final point was uh, critical to identify where the leadership and the ability to marshal the political will uh, that will be necessary to implement the select committee's recommendations can come from within Vermont. Um, so I think that's the other piece is where is, where is the will going to be? Um, you know, the legislature, the, the, the governor with, you know, internally the board of uh, trustees and then, you know, other stakeholders around the state is who's going to be pushing to make sure that these recommendations uh, when they're made are, are implemented. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I would certainly would defer to um, Trustee Kluver and to, to President uh, Judy as they're the ones that are, are really in the room where it's all happening right now as far as the steering group goes. I would defer, Megan, do you wanna go first? Yeah, there's one comment I would add um, and one piece where I do think this uh, committee and this, this work will be particularly effective. We've talked quite a bit about the different efforts that are going on over the past year and the different stakeholder groups. Um, and I'm very optimistic from the work that we've heard from this group and, and the work that the, the consultants have underway, that they are going to be able to distill the different stakeholder perspectives from those different task forces and pull together the common themes coupled with their perceptions from the external environment and present us with a holistic picture. Um, so I think that will be very helpful to us as a board and a system um, as we start to get these interim reports. Yeah, and I, I should have added as well as I do know um, that they will be reaching out to, I mean, they're talking to a whole variety of stakeholders, but I have been contacted about, you know, who are our union leaders, um, who are our chairs of um, faculty assemblies. Um, I don't know where that, that is. I'm not involved in that piece of it, but my understanding is that they are reaching out to our internal stakeholders as well. Yes, they are. Uh, and I would also say that, um, so NCHEMS is organizing some of this, but the New England Board of Higher Education is really stepping up and helping to coordinate some of the focus groups. So if you get something from them, anybody that's listening on this, make sure you respond to it. Um, and I know that they are doing a lot in the next couple of weeks. So they're really trying to pull together a lot of different constituencies really, really fast. In some ways, this is, you know, as they have said under, if we weren't in a COVID environment, they would be here in Vermont for three or four days and meet with a lot of different people. Um, on the flip side, they can do a lot of this um, over Zoom, which is more efficient, but sometimes the conversation is more challenging when it's a group of people who don't know each other. So, but I know that they are doing that. I also know that um, with some of the legislative leadership, they're trying to be really sensitive to the election. And so they are reaching out to legislative leadership, um, different, the um, governor's office, they are waiting until after Tuesday, just out of respect for um, the, 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 you know, the whole process and just waiting to make sure that people have the time they want to campaign and do that, those things, um, and then they will be hitting them up. But so I know that that is underway. Um, you know, I would also say just one other thing that I, in this, and both the committee meetings, the select committee and the steering committee are public meetings, so they're live streamed. Um, so this is all public, but at our last meeting, um, they, the NCHEMS talked about the six buckets that they're looking at, that they are going to be coming to the select committee um, on November 9th and making rec very um, detailed recommendations under these six buckets. And would it be helpful for me just to run through the, the six buckets? Because it gives you a flavor of what they're looking at. Um, so, and I'm seeing Mike raise- Yeah, that, that would be great, Joyce. So I, think. I, will, I will take my cue from you as the chair. Um, so the six buckets and quickly, I'll just go through the first bucket is structure and mission. Um, they're trying, they're all, they're looking at a, at a number of ways of what would be, they will come away with some recommendations around um, what the system should look like, um, very specifically in terms of structure. Um, the second one is administrative services and really trying to um, come up with a plan um, around uh, 
consolidating administrative services. And this isn't about consolidating administrative services. And I think, you know, Sophie's talked about this today. There's been a num uh, number of references to it. It's not about creating more at the central office. It's about thinking about how do you deliver the services across, across the system. I also want to just mention, as I mentioned these buckets, I think I had a conversation yesterday with Janet Bombardier, and I think she was spot on that I think that there's a sense of urgency. And while I think you will see the work that, this, that the board is doing right now and that the colleges are doing and that Sophie mentioned with the strategic planning, none of these are in conflict with, I think, some of the work and some of the recommendations that the NCHEMS will come with. I think they may come with more force and they will give the, um, the legislature and the governor's office and this board sort of something to fall back on in terms of no, this, this, these recommendations came from an outside entity. But I would say that, that, this, that the board should not slow down their conversations for fear that something that they're doing is going to be at cross purposes with, um, with the um, recommendations that come forward. Um, and Megan, or, um, if you feel like that's not, you should, you should speak up for sure. So the third bucket, so structure, mission, administrative services, program array and delivery, they are really thinking a lot about embedded credentials and building that, um, really thinking about credentials, degrees, and how do we make sure that people, as they come in and out of education, that they are leaving with something, can come back, but that they can build on they're not in isolation. The fourth is resource allocation. They um, they believe that they, I think they're gonna come up with a different recommendation than how the, um, this was my sense, they didn't specifically say this, but I think that they feel like there may be other ways to think about distributing, for example, the state appropriation. That, or have we thought about some of those other things? Um, physical space, they, um, are really, they really understand or they feel very strongly that there's way too much physical space um, in the VSC. And they, I think they're going to come with some recommendations of how to, how, to, how to address some of that. And then the final bucket is really UVM and VSC alignment. Um, they are really thinking very strongly coming from an outside perspective. It's always interesting when someone comes in from an outside and they've had a lot of experience in other um, where they think there's some missed opportunity. And so it'll be um, both from, I think, a operational standpoint, but also in terms of programmatic alignment um, and thinking about how do we collectively better serve the state than we're doing now. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it back to Megan and see if you have some other, other things, but I thought it might be helpful for this group to hear those broader buckets. Yes, I think that captured it very well. Um, and I, I think one point that's really stuck out to me is that in the discussions of the committees, um, they very much have been aligned with the strategic priorities that we've discussed here today, the discussion in EPSL. So I think even as we all try and operate in this world where there, there's so many different moving parts, I do see them all starting to come together at least directionally. And Joyce or Megan, just to remind everyone that those recommendations will be ready on November 9th or they'll be presented at a meeting that's going to be on November 9th. So they will be, uh, so the next step is for them to present, um, you know, their a draft to the select committee because in the end, the select committee has to give their feedback and get behind and support it. Um, and this is, we are, the select committee, um, uh, is meeting twice in November. The steering committee, I, I said yesterday, I wish they didn't have so many S's, like give us a different name, but the select committee, the steering committee, the steering committee is the small group and we, we meet every other week, but the select committee is the larger group that Sophie referenced. And they are, we're meeting twice in November because they are gonna present to us their, broad, their plan on November 9th for feedback they will take that and refine their recommendations and get give us another crack at their draft the end of November because then it will be released to legislative leadership and the governor's office in early December. And that 
And I think by then, you know, even though they'll have two more like layers of a draft due after that, I think the December, early December meeting, early December draft is going to give us, I think all of us collectively, a fair amount of specificity, or that's what I'm hoping for. Um, Megan, would you agree? Yes. And the between December, the second draft is in April. Do I have that right? Uh, no, mid February. Yeah, April, oh, mid February. Yeah. In between December and mid February, that's an opportunity for for all types of stakeholder feedback. Is that the is that the idea? Yes, and they're also planning um, after the December meeting between December and February. You know, they will continue to make adjustments, make changes, but also their plan is to be out. I don't like this term, but this is this is a term that's commonly used is socializing the plan to see what needs to be adjusted. What, you know, where did they not go deep enough? Where is it like this is like, nope, this isn't going to work, those kind of things. And at the same time, providing more detail. I think that, you know, so it's a couple different layers because the December meeting, I mean, the December draft, you know, will have some detail, but I think that over time, and in all fairness, as they're out talking to other people, how do they get even more, more provide more detail? That said, I also want to just caution all of us that, you know, this is happening pretty fast. And so I think that they will provide sort of the guideposts, but I think the level of detail then will to really commit to action will be this board and the and the colleges along with working side by side with the legislature. Because in the end, the legislature and the governor's office are gonna have to find the financial wherewithal and support it. The mm -hmm. actual doing and the implementation is gonna have to happen here. So I think the critical piece is we gotta, you know, and this is the magic and can we make this happen is can this all come together and can we all come together behind this and sort of move us forward? It's a heavy lift. I recognize that, um, but I think we're we're all trying to give it our all. So, Mike. Yeah, Karen. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank. Um, there are there's so many people to thank in our <laughs> system and beyond. The folks that are on these committees and working so hard, not the least of which are our two contributors to this effort, three contributions to this effort. So I thank you all. Um, I've, and, and I've tried to follow all this and there's a lot of good thinking and, and the MTEMs in particular, I, I thought it, we're, we're really headed, asking the right questions. They made some very interesting and I think on target observations and they provide dates. As a trustee, um, I get lost, I will admit, in the world of dates with all the committees, and this is helpful. Can anyone provide, or is it too early to provide? There is an end date when we no longer get money from anybody to keep us going. And we're living in uncertain times that could even exacerbate. I don't want to be a black cloud. But um, I know in my little world, we plan, what if we end up like we did last year? What do we do here? How do we, so we've been thinking, and I know you folks have been thinking. Are there dates, even tentative dates, that the trustees can plan on so that we know by this date when we get this, and I know we're going to be doing things as we go along. But are there dates that we can tentatively put on the calendar that we know that by this date, we need to take, take some action? Uh, we had guideposts. Have you folks, I guess, this is a good question, I guess, for Sophie or, or Joyce. Do we have uh, dates? It's a, it's a perfect segue because actually our next discussion is going to be on precisely that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I don't want to jump ahead, but um, we, we will be discussing those momentarily. And so maybe finish this discussion and then we can get into that. How about Adam then, Lynn? Yeah, great, thank you. One of the things that really jumped out at me, and I, I thought this, I think they called it the survey of the environment or something, the mm -hmm. title of their study, that just really 
popped out at me. And I, I think I knew this from our from just our work, um, but the, the statistic that 30 to 40% of our courses have less than 20 students. Really, with the way the chart showed that, and this is the CCV is an exception to that. Um, that really jumped out at me. Uh, and then if you go to the, the last screen where it, it does the sort of um, financial sustainability results, vitally important or necessary and unavoidable survey, um, that reductions in operating expenses that may impact array of programs offered at each campus has really strong support in both vitally important and necessary and unavoidable. So it, it seems to indicate that there's really, I think, I feel like that didn't necessarily exist in the past, the consensus um, that hard decisions are ahead uh, and that really what's driving our challenges is that we have in my opinion, too many courses with too few students. It's not mm -hmm. rocket science, that's not a surprise to anybody, but this data really highlights that. And yeah, Adam, you weren't, I don't think you were part of the previous discussion for EPSL, but that that was no. a big focus of what we we had just, um, we talked about too. So we're happy to follow up with you on that um, as well. Yeah, just a, it was helpful for my thinking going forward. Great. Um, thanks, Adam, how about Lynn? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that I know there's a concern that I've heard from people on the board here is that we are not getting enough feedback from external people, um, people in the communities, people in the state who would have a, there, that were a little bit too much inside the bottle, inside the bubble. Um, and I know I was told somewhere that that's what your committees are going to do is get some feedback from outsiders. Yeah. Um, if you haven't already. Uh, the question I have is, so how did we get access to that? Or do we have to watch it on YouTube or, or what? Well, I think that, um, Lynn, I would say that um, they, they're they doing those meetings. Um, we, as you, you were, I know Sophie asked all of you, we all submitted um, uh, stakeholders that we thought the group, sh they should be reaching out to. And I know they're mm -hmm. doing that in different ways. Uh, those are not public. Those are not, they're not live streaming those conversations. Yeah. They'll be summarizing those conversations. So we certainly can get um, through Sophie and Megan and I, we can provide the board with that feedback, um, but they are convening. Their plan is um, they have been doing a combination of one, um, of doing some individual um, discussions with people but also trying to bring together very small groups of different individuals. Um, you know, there's a number of people from the business community that, um, that they've been, um, that we've asked. You know, what I love about, I find very interesting is there are four or five people on the select committee that are rep, that even though like um, Jeff Weld, even though he's an alum, he is a director of, I think communications or something at Casella. So he has a very strong business, or even though he's an alum of Castleton, he brings a business perspective. Um, and um, the, the, um, the member of the board of trustees, Briar Alpert, um, he, is rep he is there representing the, the UVM board of trustees, and yet his, he has a phenomenal background. So I think that what I'm grateful to is there's five or six people on the select committee that don't have a higher ed background, but they have a they bring a business perspective and they represent really important business sectors in the state. So, so um, yes, we're trying to go outside of the committee, but we're also I'm pretty happy that um, we have a pretty diverse select group. I one of the things, and I would be curious what Sophie and Megan think is that even though we're on Zoom and the 15 people don't know each other, the level of engagement is when we have these meetings is, is, is it's great. And I have to say, I've been pleasantly surprised and pleased by that, that people have very much moved in. Uh, Sophie or Megan, thoughts, I mean, feedback about that? Oh, I would say yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I tend to not say much because I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm inside. I, I prefer to listen and hear what everyone's saying. But um, yeah, the, and I would say the amount of engagement has increased with each meeting. Um, but certainly I would say at the last meeting, I was very happy to see people speak up and, 
and um, and and discuss, you know, the topics. And I'd say the group it's it is a very diverse and a, a very effectively diverse group, and I think I'm also seeing folks really become more educated around what we do as a system and some of the challenges and opportunities. And I think that will be helpful in getting to a, a really effective long-term plan going forward. The only other thing I would add is one of the things I think this, that has been quite effective that um, NCHEMS has used is because this select committee only meet once, once a month, they are constantly at sending out little mini surveys and questionnaires to the select committee for feedback based on, you know, like, this is what we've heard, you know, what do you think? So it's, so even though we're only meeting once a month, there is a lot of engagement, trying to build engagement and feedback from the committee in between meetings, which I think has, has contributed to when we have a Zoom meeting, more engagement. One last question. Um, Joyce and Megan, the, uh, Adam referred to the environmental high level observations. A lot of these are things many of us involved with this board and maybe even yeah. involved in the legislature, a few people in the legislature are aware of these things. This is a pretty diverse group. What, how do they react to these things? I mean, some of them are pretty obvious, but how are they responding to these interesting observations about Vermont and our education and our demographics and all of it. You know, I would say, Lynn, it's across the board. You know, and I think um, what Adam just said, I think there are pieces of stuff that everybody sort of knows, but some people don't know. And then there's other nuggets in that data that are like, hmm. you know, I had this inkling, but now it's staring me right in the face. So I think that, I think that um, NCHEM's approach was we need to provide everyone with a baseline of data. And that my hunch is that this is what they do when they work with any state is they have to establish, okay, here's, so that everyone who's involved in this work sort of has sort of the same foundation. So I think that people, um, on one hand, um, you know, for people that are internal to this, Sophie, uh, Suresh, President um, Garamella at UVM, different people know this stuff, but I think others are, it's establishing a baseline that gives them like, oh, this is really serious and we need to, uh, to do stuff, something about it. And, the stat and th to move away from the status quo being acceptable. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Sophie, anything to add on this or should we go to the timelines because- I think we should go to the timelines because I know we're getting close to you know, to our to our end point, and I again, I, I want to make sure people have a chance to go grab something to eat and take a breather before we dive into finance and facilities. So, um, Yasmin's going to help me with this. Um, we've I've just just to make it easier. I I find dates easier if I can see them. Um, so this is just, and we can share this um, after the meeting as well. Um, so yeah, the next slide, Yasmin. Um, this is just looking through again, you know, at the last meeting that we had, I think there was a concern and Karen just echoed it um, in terms of what's happening and when and given all these interconnected processes that are moving forward. So I just these are really just the dates, but I just want to run through. Um, so everyone kind of has a, a sense of, of, of what the timelines look like. So the next one. <laughs> Right, so the Legislative Select Committee, uh, these are the, the full meetings that of the whole, the group of 15 that are coming up and then when the draft reports are due. Um, so again, you can see we're meeting approximately monthly um, and when those three, um, those three reports are due. We will, um, and we've got coming up, you'll see on a slide, but we have a, that December 4th, I think will be a significant date. Uh, we're hoping very much there won't be a request for an extension of that date. Um, that's a Friday. We have a full board meeting on the 7th, which is the Monday right after that. So we won't have much chance to digest whatever comes out on the 4th, but um, there will be, you know, we will have a meeting after that. And I'm hoping we'll be adding some additional meetings for us uh, as a board um, moving forward. So the next one, Yasmin. 
Um, the other piece that's going to be critical to this, obviously, is the budget. I mean, we can have all the recommendations in the world, but if we don't know what the financial uh, support is going to be from the state, that's in and of itself is going to dictate what we can do. If we have, you know, greater support, um, additional uh, bridge funding, uh, we can do more. If um, if we don't, then what we have to do, we're going to have a much shorter timeline. Going to going to Karen's point, we're going to have a much shorter timeline in which to take action, and the action will will need to of necessity be more dramatic. Um, so this is what we're currently looking at for the state budget and the legislative process. So we have uh, we have to submit our request to the administration coming up November 20th. Um, and then, you know, we, we will be working uh, with the governor's office to hopefully be included in the, the governor's budget. And then, you know, we'll be working with legislative leaders moving forward as the budget um, proceeds. Um, we're trying to, you know, we are already working on that um, and laying the groundwork now. I think it's too late to wait until, you know, January. I think um, Bill Lippert made that point at the last meeting. This, this work is already underway and we need to be part of the conversation now that's happening over at the State House. And we are, we are doing that. Uh, the next one. So this is our current meetings that we have scheduled. Um, so again, you can see we have the December 7th meeting, which is just the next day, business day after the report comes out. So I'm, what I would like, and we can, we can talk about this more at the, our November meeting, I would hope that we could find a time in, in January um, to have a board meeting um, and then one in February as well, the February one to be after the, the February, uh, the second report comes out. And then my thought is that we should have one in late April after the final report comes out, um, just to make sure that we're staying on track uh, with the select committee. And the next one. Uh, so this is, we'll be talking about this obviously far more this afternoon, um, but as far as our system budget goes, and I think this, this goes along again to the concern about timing and when decisions have to be made, we'll have an initial discussion about the FY22 budget this afternoon. Um, we're just at the very beginning of that process. We're actually early compared to where we normally are in talking about the um, next academic year budget. Um, but we'll be doing, you know, first pass, um, second pass budget refinement. So again, as we go through our budget process, we'll be keeping track of what's happening with the select committee and what's happening in the legislature with the budget. Um, and I think that will help inform us as to, you know, what actions we, we may need to take and what the timelines for those would be. So these pieces all fit together as we move forward. Um, and the next one. Um, this just repeats um, what we had already talked about earlier about our strategic priorities. This is work that will be going on while we, while all those other things are happening. We will be continuing to do this work. And then I think the final slide, um, this was just as a placeholder really, and, and we can discuss this further if the board would like more education on this. But depending on what decisions are made, um, if we're looking at reconfiguration, whether that's a consolidation of institutions, um, single accreditation, I mean, there are a variety of, of possibilities out there. These are other deadlines that we would need to be aware of. Um, so the length of time that we have to make these obviously is gonna depend on the availability of the resources we have. So again, that's the financial piece as to how much time we would have to, to accomplish things. Um, but just as a, and we, we sort of know this from having gone through the unification of, of Johnson and Linden, these things take along the, the other pieces, the external pieces take time. So um, any significant change, um, technically called a substantive change would have to be prepared. That doesn't happen quickly. Um, and we would then submit the sub substantive change proposal to NETCHI, which is our, the New England Commission on Higher Education, which is our regional accreditor. Then NETCHI has to go through their review and approval process. Uh, depends on timing of when you get a substantive change proposal in, they meet a certain number of times a year. And then the other piece is the Department of Education approval. Um, if we're changing the institution, so for example, as we did with um, Johnson and Linden, uh, you have to get approval from the Department of Education um, in order to get financial aid and obviously financial aid is is um, the lifeblood of our institutions if we don't have access 
to financial aid, we we're not going to be able to function at all. Um, so that's the other piece to remember is that the, the, the Department of Education approval, um, it takes some time, but it has to be time to coincide with the start of the financial aid year. So the, that that isn't a floating uh, time through the year. That's uh, That has to be done sort of in the spring um, to make sure that we are, we're ready to issue financial aid for whatever a new institution or a new you know entity would look like as of um, July 1st. So those I just wanted to share with you. And again, we're happy to um, provide further education to the board if there's interest um, as we move. I mean, I anticipate there would be, but as we move forward, if we start getting into those kinds of discussions um, would be to you know um, reach out and have um, you know someone come in to sort of talk about what, what those pieces look like in greater detail. Thanks, Yasmin. Any questions on the timelines? And again, I will will share that with with all of you. I just um, we've been kind of working on it, so we didn't have it in the original board materials. We will get a copy of these. Yes, I'll I'll send that to you, and we'll add it to the board materials that were posted. But we'll 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 go ahead and add that in. Thanks. Yes, Bill. Definitely. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I would also just ask, is there, when we talked about like some kind of Gantt chart or something along the lines of that, to the degree that the various schedules of meetings for the select committee, the board, et cetera, if they could be merged into one single document that shows, okay, this is when this, this, this is how these fit together. I mean, just rather than having to kind of like well, I mean, we did. This is very helpful, but but that, yeah. that would be my that would be my desire. And I, <laughs> so Yasmin did do a beautiful Gantt chart, but it just seemed like it was really hard to display that. So, um, well, even but if we it will, was just a chronological listing of everything you we, just had, but just put them, you know, with just color differentiated or something. These we will are, we will work are, on these that. These are board of directors. These are select committees. These are just the. We'll work on that. It just, this was the kind of the easier way to yep. make it I, I more understandable it. in the moment. <laughs> That's great. Um, a couple other comment, quick, quick comment. Um, if there's any type of recommendation that requires statutory change, not just financial money, financial appropriation, but there could be something that requires actually statutory change. I think that has not been I mean, that was, that's been mentioned somewhere along the way, but uh, I think it needs to be put on our radar so that uh, if in fact the underlying statute needs some modification, that should be thought about and put into some kind of time frame as well. I think that was, I mean- uh, Maybe that's reflected, I just didn't pick up on it. Well, no, no, it wasn't reflected on that per se, but I think what President Judy just indicated was that one of the buckets that would be discussed um, in that the December uh, 4th report um, included um, that aspect of it. So I, I think that if if that's the case, if they're going to be making a recommendation that would require um, legislative attention, we presumably we will know that by early December because otherwise it's going to be out of the, the cycle in order to get addressed at this upcoming legislative session. Well, it just needs to be reflected in the time frame. Okay. So there's, a, there's certain things that, again, as as you've done well with the uh, financial time frame timeline. There would be stakeholder process inside the building, so to speak, which we don't go inside anymore. But you know, as to how that would transpire. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Bill. This is just such a monumental effort, uh, in my view, to involve everyone who wants to be involved uh, on a variety of fronts and to get expertise, professional expertise. It's objective. So I, I think it's a great effort and I think it's a necessary effort and I think it's gonna lead to credibility and to um, it'll enhance the ability to um, put this out to Vermonters. 
Um, there will be change and, and there may be people who aren't happy, but it, at least they will be presented with a rationale for whatever changes are, are put forward. So I feel good about this. And again, I'm grateful. You folks are working so hard above and beyond. All right, well, I think and, that's, and, yeah. <laughs> and Bill, Bill, the legislature's working until October of 2021 again, so we have plenty of time, right? <laughs> oh, we, don't, we don't plan to, <laughs> and we're contributing our services now. <laughs> Continuing to contribute our services. Any other, any other questions on the timeline? I think that's a good idea though, to get it in one unified document so we can see how they line up. And, and Sophie, I think the timeline that we have control over the board meetings and whatnot, that makes sense in terms of the timing and yeah. you know, when we need to when we need to have those group, group meetings. Well, then why don't we go to um, any other business? Lunch. <laughs> yeah, so why don't we, uh, any public comment then? And if there is, please also speak up because I, I don't have everyone on my screen. But seeing and hearing none. Um, so Sophie, do we need to vote to adjourn or can we just um, adjourn? I think, I think, I don't think anyone's going to object. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we, uh, all those in favor of adjourning? I think I heard a lot of muted eyes. <laughs>